Good morning, everyone. My name is Troy Paddock, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of seven Connecticut State University's History Department Summer Teachings. Today's topic is Fascism in the 20th and 21st Century. Um, in my opinion, the term fascism is perhaps the most abused term in American discourse in the 21st century. It is usually used as a shut-up line. If you call somebody a fascist, you can then discount anything that they have to say. It's much like calling somebody a racist or a communist. It's just designed to end conversation and not further dialogue. Um, also in the American time, context, fascism is generally synonymous with the Nazis, when in the reality fascism was a broader European movement in the first half of the 20th century that starts in Italy, obviously with Mussolini and Hitler, those are the two most famous examples of fascist leaders, but there were fascist movements in many other countries in Europe, and there was even a smaller fascist movement in the United States. Um, but the term has lost its meaning in the 21st century with people talking about Islamo-fascism, eco-fascism, or the more derisive comment like feminazis. What I would like to do is return to a more sort of appropriate understanding of what fascism is and what the definitions are and then we can look and see just how applicable it might be in the 21st century. Now, a number of groups have tried to define fascism. The Marxists have argued that fascism is just the last stage of capitalism. And while there's certainly a link between big business and fascism, to call it the last stage of capitalism is problematic. Similarly, people on the right have tried recently to try to say fascism is actually a liberal construct with Jonah Goldberg's book, Liberal Fascism, the latest example of trying to do that. And it's, it's just not a particularly convincing argument for a number of reasons. There is a standard sort of mainstream academic consensus about what fascism is. And it has the following characteristics. First, it is anti-egalitarian. Fascists do not believe that all men and women are created equal. The second aspect of fascism is it feels that there has been an aggrieved past that must be righted. In Germany, they were talking about the loss in World War I, the stab in the back theory, and the unfairness of the Treaty of Versailles. In Mussolini's Italy, there was also agreement over the First World War, even though they were on the winning side, they were upset about the fact that they did not get what they thought were the just rewards for their efforts. There was a cult of the leader. In Italy, Mussolini was Il Duce, and obviously Hitler was Der Führer. And the leader was supposed to be the embodiment of the movement. He was the will of the people manifest. The single greatest sin in fascism is to disagree with the leader. Fascism is also um, characterized by a hyper ethno nationalism. In Germany, this was um, exemplified with this notion of, of an Aryan race as designed to be a leading race. And if you weren't Aryan, you couldn't be German. There was also a strong um, ethno nationalistic element in Mussolini's Italy as well. Closely tied to that ethno nationalism was an anti communism. And what they hated about communism was its attempt to be international. The idea that the workers of the world should unite. Fascism is much more interested in the nation and, and in, in its people. Fascism is also marked by both violence and propaganda. Hitler and Mussolini both had their paramilitary groups, the Squadristi in Italy and the SA of the Sturmabteilung, stormtroopers for Germany. And they were literally street fighters. They would beat up their political opponents, they would cause problems. And what this did in the eyes of many people was this showed that these were people who would fight what they believe, for what they believed in. This was a movement that had strength and had energy. Fascism is also dominated by propaganda. And one of the most lucid aspects of Hitler's Mein Kampf is the chapter on propaganda. And he says that propaganda must be black and white. There's no shade of gray. Of gray. Your opponent can never have a point. 
you can never sow any seeds of doubt. Propaganda must also be repeated and repeated and repeated in order to be effective. Propaganda is not designed to persuade intellectuals, it is designed to persuade the masses. No fancy arguments, you go straight for the gut. Last but not least, I borrow the historian Jeffrey Hurst's term and talk about reactionary modernism as a facet of fascism. It's reactionary because fascists are always looking back to a glorious past. Um, for the Nazis, you know, they were trying to create the Third Reich, with the first one being the Holy Roman Empire, and the second one being the imp Imperial Germany that was unified under Bismarck and William I. The modernism aspect is the embrace of technology. Fascists um, understand technology and they understand the new and they do embrace it. Hitler was the first politician to regularly use an airplane to, try to fly to political rallies. He was also the first politician to understand the importance of radio as a means to connect to virtually every household in Germany. And he tried to make the radio um, affordable in order to be able to do that. His goal was to have his voice heard in every single home in Germany. Now, it's important to talk a little bit about the politics of fascism. There are other aspects of fascism, but my main concern today is politics. The German jurist Karl Schmidt wrote the concept of the political, and in this, he really does identify the essence of the politics of fascism. He's going to say that the political is the most basic existential distinction that you can have um, among, among people, and it rests on the distinction of friend and enemy. And he says, an enemy exists only when at least potentially one fighting collectivity of people confronts a similar, similar collectivity. Now, obviously, in an international context, this talks about war. But within a domestic context, and this is also a possibility, political compromise with an opposing party is considered nothing short of treason. And Germany exemplifies this when Hitler declares um, Germany to be a one-party state in July of 1933. And this is sort of the evidence that he has seized complete control of Germany and any kind of political opposition is simply not permitted. Now, this is what fascism looks like. These are the characteristics of fascism. And this is how a fascist regime operates and this is how fascist leaders operate. So is it possible to have fascism in the 21st century? And considering our current political context, can we reasonably call President Donald Trump a fascist leader? Well, let's look at the characteristics of fascism. Is it anti-egalitarian? Yes, it is. Has Trump behaved in an anti-egalitarian way? Well, to be honest, yes. Um, his denigration of um, immigrants is one example. His denigration of people who he does not agree with is an example. His sometimes covert, more often overt courtship of white nationalists is yet another example of the anti-egalitarian aspect of his rule. Is there an aggrieved past? Yes, there is in Trump's world. If you recall his acceptance speech for the Republican nomination, he talked about American carnage. He said America had been humiliated internationally and it was divided domestically and that it was just, it was a mess. It was a disaster. Is there a cult of the leader? Oh, there most certainly is with President Trump. In that same speech and talking about the problems, he literally says, quote, I alone can fix it. He, he embodied himself as, as a savior. And as his rule as president, this cult of the leader is still quite present. He values loyalty among, um, above any other um, quality and to disagree with him on any issue, no matter how small, is to incur his wrath and face being ostracized from his political party. Um, and there are several Republican politicians who have retired from politics because they were not sufficiently deferential to Donald Trump. Is there an ethno-nationalism? Most definitely. Donald Trump, and I know some people might not like to hear this, 
is playing on white supremacy. He simply is. His reactions to the um, tragedy in Charlottesville, when he said that there were good people on both sides, is an example of that. Um, his consistent denigration of immigrants, calling them rapists, murderers, and thugs, is another example. Um, his consistent rallying um, for support of right-wing white nationalist groups and the fact that he's gotten the endorsement from the Ku Klux Klan are just more examples of the way that he Trump appeals to an ethno-nationalist element in his political campaigning. Violence certainly has played a role in Donald Trump's um, political rise. In his rallies, he has encouraged violence. He has talked about how in the good old days when people made a scene new, they would just beat them up and throw them out. And he thinks that's just not a bad thing. He has encouraged police violence. The, the famous quote of him saying, you know, when you're going to put someone into the car and you put your hand on their head to make sure they don't hit their head on the door, I don't think that's necessary. These are just examples of um, Trump encouraging violence and his supporters seeing that as a sign of strength. Propaganda is also uh, an integral part of Trump's rule as president. Um, he is consistently um, reiterating the same talking points. Uh, he has lied a record number of times. I believe the um, a newspaper in Toronto has been tracking his lies and they are well over 19,000 lies many of them the same lies. So he's also following this idea with propaganda is that you keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. And Trump also has hit, um, conservative radio and Fox News to consistently rebroadcast those talking points. Reactionary modernism. Trump also is impressed with technology even some technologies that he doesn't understand, but there is one modern technology that he understands extraordinarily well, probably better than any politician before him, and that is Twitter. Donald Trump uses Twitter very effectively as a way to circumvent the media, and he has reached literally millions of followers um, unmediated, so he gets his side of the story out and he doesn't have to worry about being factually accurate. He doesn't have to worry about anyone stopping him in any way, shape, or form. And so if we are asking the question of, you know, is it fair to call Donald Trump a fascistic leader? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. He meets all of the criteria that were characteristic of fascist leaders and fascist movements in the early part of the 20th century. Now, whether or not he continues to be successful, that is really up to the voters for this November. I would encourage you all, whether you support Donald Trump or not, to go out and vote. Thank you for your attention.